Whoever has their Bibles, please get them ready to follow along. So you remember in the morning we heard this wonderful sermon about the temple of God. We heard how it was always meant to represent the glory of God. And we saw how over time as man sinned, the glory left the temple. But the people still worshipped it. They, they, the temple itself became almost like an idol. And we heard in the morning also that the brazen serpent that also became a, uh, like an idol for the people. And we see how God always desired us to be the temple of the Lord. In the New Covenant, we see that we are the temple of God. And as we are going through the letter of Philippians, we will see that we will see how we are the temple of God. And Apostle Paul shows the humility of Jesus Christ, how he came down and lived the perfect life. And then we get to the part of this letter that he actually gives us an example of how it's possible to live the way Christ lived for us. As it says, let us have the mind of Christ. And there was two people in the letter of Philippians that had the mind of Christ. And I would like to share a few thoughts about these two wonderful men. One of them being Timothy, the other one Epaphroditus, a man that's not commonly known to us, but we, there's a few things we could learn from even this man that is very unknown for us. But today the title of my sermon is Being a Faithful Son and Brother in the Faith. Being a Faithful Son and Brother. We will see that Timothy is referred to as a son and Epaphroditus is referred to as a brother. So Apostle Paul shows that there's proof that you could live that way. You can have the mind of Christ. And in the beginning of the chapter, he talks about having the like mind, serving each other, not caring for yourself only. So let's, let's open up our Bibles to the second, letter of Philippians, uh, second chapter of Philippians. And we'll read from verse 19 through 24. And this section talks about Timothy, a very well-known follower of Christ, and he did so much to, fall, to continue the service of Paul, because Paul knew his time was coming to an end. He was so close to dying so many times, and he wanted his uh, witness testimony, his, the church that he planted to grow. So he, planted, uh, he, he took this young man, Timothy, and discipled him so that he can grow. So let's read verses 19 through 24. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I, am, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. So the first point that I would like to focus on is what it means to be a true son in the faith. So Peter, uh, I'm sorry, P Paul refers to Timothy as a son, as a true son. This is the most dearest kind of relationship you can have, a father-son relationship. So the question I have for us today is, why does Apostle Paul call Timothy his son? Why doesn't he call him a brother, a worker, a fellow soldier, as he calls other people a fellow worker, uh, somebody that he shares in the labor of the Lord, but he calls him a son? So we see that Apostle Paul was like a spiritual father to Timothy because he, he encouraged him. We know that Apostle uh, Timothy, he had a very godly mother and grandmother who taught him the scriptures. We know about that. But Apostle Paul, uh, Paul was like a mentor to Timothy. He, Timothy needed somebody older than him that can raise him up and can encourage him to teach him in the things of, of Christ to help him serve the church. And I think all of us need to have somebody that we can look up to as a father figure and we should all have Maybe somebody, maybe even my age, somebody that is younger that we can mentor. As uh, Titus was talking about the children, somebody that can look up to us. We all can encourage somebody, just like Paul encouraged Timothy. And we know that Paul was not uh, his uh, biological son, father. He was just a mentor, somebody that was pouring into the life of this young man because he saw the potential. He saw, 
He saw how he desired to serve the Lord, and he worked on that. He, he took him, even though maybe others were uh, looking down at his youth, as it says in Timothy, but Paul encouraged him. But we know that uh, Paul does not only call Timothy uh, his son. There's actually two other men that Paul refers to as sons, and one of them being Onesimus, which was uh, in Philemon 1, it says, 1.10 says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I begot in my bonds. And we know that's, uh, that how he, he, the man that ran away from his uh, master, but he, he gave him spiritual life. And Apostle Paul says, he's like my son, and he cares for him, and he says, take him back. And also a, uh, a young man, uh, Titus, was also called a, a son by Apostle Paul. In Titus 1.4, he says, To Titus, a true son in our common faith. And Apostle Paul trusted so much in Titus that he says, Go and complete the work that is unfinished in Crete. He says, Work on it. So Apostle Paul so uh, loved Titus that he knew that Titus wouldn't start some kind of divisions or heresy. He knew that Titus was faithful, so he calls him a son. But here he calls Timothy a son. And he knew that Timothy will not start any kind of uh, wrong teaching, a division, or maybe start some kind of conflict in the church because he trusted him, because he poured his whole soul into Timothy. So the second question I'd like to ask is, what, what did Paul want Timothy to do from this section? We see a few things he wanted him to do. The first of which is to send him to Philippi to encourage, to find out how they are doing, first of all, to find out their state, because now everything is so we're so connected, but back then it was only send a letter or visit somebody in person. And Paul, even though he was in bond in jail, but one thing that would have encouraged him most was to know that the church that he planted was doing well and that they were serving the Lord. So think about it. For him, if we were in his position, we would say, oh, well, if I get out of jail, then I will be encouraged. But for Paul, even if he was to die in jail, he was encouraged. He would have been encouraged just by knowing that the Philippian church is faithful to the word. Just like John says, it is the greatest thing for me to see that my children walk in, in the truth. Paul also wanted them to walk in the truth. So another thing we have to point notice here is that uh, Paul says, but I trust in the Lord. He says that actually three times in the section that we will use. And in this whole letter, it's not a big letter, but he uses this phrase nine times. I trust in the Lord. So he completely trusted God. He, even in the will, if, if it was his will to die in jail or being executed, he was willing. He, he didn't say, I will go, I will see you. He didn't give them false hope. He said, only if the Lord wills. And another way of thinking about this is, if God is willing, I will come and do this. And remember how James uh, gives us a warning about boasting about tomorrow's day. He says, James 4, 14 says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall do this and that. So Apostle Paul does not act presumptuous and say, I will be there, don't worry. He's saying, only if the Lord wills. He completely trusts his life to the Lord. And a third question I would like to ask here is, what characteristics do we see in Timothy that we can learn from or we can imitate because Timothy has a very godly character, and if we looked at just uh, his character throughout all Scripture, we could spend a whole uh, series just looking at his life. But today, just looking very uh, shortly, let's look at what things we can learn from Timothy from this passage that we read. So we see that in verse 20, he says, For I have no one like-minded. So first of all, we see that Timothy was like-minded in the sense that Paul... And Timothy, they, they were different men, they were different age, but they had the same mind. One was not thinking worldly things, and one was not thinking heavenly things. They were both united in thinking godly th thoughts about growing the church, about being useful for eternity. So he was like-minded, and that actually gives evidence that it is possible to, uh, to live out verse 2, Philippians 2.2, 2, where it says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So we know these words are not just words that sound good that Apostle Paul wrote, but it, it was visible in his life. It was evidence that it is possible to be like-minded, to not be 
divided over small and in, uh, not things that are not very essential. We cannot divide over doctrine, but th there's just things that we have to unite and be like-minded. When it comes to serving the Lord and comes to the things that are written in the Bible, the black and white, we have to be dogmatic, but on small things, we should not be divided. We should be united because we are one church. We also have to notice that when he starts the letter, the very first words he says, Paul and Timothy, who are bond servants or bond slaves of Jesus Christ. So Timothy was a bond slave. So whatever Paul was doing, Timothy was doing the same thing. They were both slaves of Jesus Christ. Even though Paul was in prison, but Timothy was free, they were still slaves to the same Lord, Jesus Christ. So the other thing we could learn from Timothy's character is to, that the sincerity of his heart. Verse 20, the second part says, there's no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. So we see he was sincere. He, he did not have a, like a, a, fake care, a fake act. He did not put a mask and pretend to care for their needs. He was sincere in caring the church caring for the church of Philippi. And we know that's where Timothy actually began his ministry. In, Philipp in Acts 16, it talks about that's the point where Paul took Timothy. and he So, t so Timothy started his ministry in Philippi. So th these people were really close and dear to his heart. So we also see that Timothy had a sincere, caring attitude in in verse 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but Timothy is different. It is, uh, I think he even includes us here because we often seek our own. The only way we can go from seeking our own to seeking the things of God is and we, if we give up of ourselves and, and have the mind of Christ, which is what he started off this whole chapter from. And the other thing we could learn from his character is that he was proven. He was tested. He, he did not just come out of nowhere and say, oh, look what I can do for, for you, Paul. He, he worked with Paul. He served, uh, and he, he was proven, as it says in, in verse 22. But you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. So he's proven, and that's... Good one. If somebody wants to serve, maybe even in Sunday school, somebody has a desire but does not know, is this the right thing for me? Just try it out. Just like uh, Brother Titus was saying, you know, if you want to serve children, take a few days and see if this is the right thing for you. Start somewhere. Start seeing maybe this is where God wants me to serve. Because Timothy, he started with small things, and then Paul knew that he would pass his whole ministry on to this young man. And we see that uh, in the Corinthians, uh, we see this example in the Corinthian that he was proven, he was a test that he served in the church. A uh, letter of uh, 1 Corinthians 4.17 talks also about Timothy. It says here, For this reason I have sent to you, Timothy, to you, who, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord who will remind you of my ways as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul did not have any doubts in Timothy that he would start teaching something new. He was instructed in the ways of the Lord. And Apostle Paul is not acting boastful here by saying my ways. He's saying because the Lord revealed the truth to him. And because he was an apostle to the Gentiles, he, he's saying I received the word from the Lord and he passed it on to Timothy, and he was faithful because he was a faithful son in the faith. So that we just look shortly at the life of Timothy here as described in these verses. And the second point I would like to share with us is about Epaphroditus. So what it means to be a true brother in the faith. This man, Epaphroditus, is called a brother. He's not called a son. And we know that there is a difference in relationship between a son, a father-son, and a brother-to-brother or sister-to-brother. It's a sibling relationship is often different, but it's still a very important relationship. And Epaphroditus was a man that served, served Paul in ways that were different from Timothy, but without Epaphroditus, uh, Paul would not be able to do his ministry. So let, let's read the section about Epaphroditus, which is from verse 25 to the end of the chapter. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my beloved my, my, bro uh, my brother, fellow worker, 
And fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my needs, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him, to, uh, sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because of the work of Christ he, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. So this is a passage that talks about this man, Epaphroditus, who we know nothing else except what is written in this letter of Philippians. And again, it's mentioned in the end of this book at, in chapter 4. He's mentioned that he brought the gift from the church, the Philippi church, to, to, to Paul. So they received the gift from him through, uh, through Epaphroditus. So a few things we could learn from him. So number one is why was Epaphroditus... Uh, who was Epaphroditus to Paul? Who was he? We see, first of all, he, he's mentioned as a brother. He is a brother, a brother in Christ to the Apostle Paul. And what a great title that would be, a brother. We all should have also brothers that we can encourage, brothers in our faith. We should gather together and edify each other, have th those that can serve each other. So Epaphroditus was a brother. But then again, it says, that he was a fellow worker or a fellow companion. So they served together because Epaphroditus was doing more of the dirty work that oftentimes people don't want to do. He, was, he would have been more like the deacon and Timothy would have been more like the pastor. And oftentimes we do the work that is, um, people don't want to do it, but we do the work. And Epaphroditus was the man that was to do the work that maybe nobody else was to do, but everyone needs to serve the Lord in the, the things that he gives us. Not everybody is going to be a Paul or a Peter, but we can all be a Timothy or we can be a, an Epaphroditus who is just willing to serve even unto death. We don't know what kind of sickness he had, but whatever it was, he was near, close to dying. But the Lord gave him mercy. So we see that he was also a fellow soldier, and just as now we saw the the presentation about the armor of God. He, this man was not a weak man. He was a soldier. If Paul calls him a soldier, that means he knew how to stand for himself. He knew how to go long distance. He knew how to defend himself. And he, he had the, all the armor of God that we just heard about. He had the armor. He knew how to protect himself physically, but most of all spiritually. He knew how to fight all the attacks of the devil. So 2 Timothy 2.13 talks about the, the good soldier, and Epaphroditus was a good soldier. So 2 Timothy 2.13 says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of his life, of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So when you're a soldier, you do the, the things that please the one that you're serving. And even Epaphroditus, he was serving the Lord, Jesus Christ. So he wanted to do that which was pleasing to him. And also we see that who was Epaphroditus? He was a messenger. As we read on in verse 25, it says, A fellow worker and a fellow soldier, but your messenger. And the word that is used here actually in the Greek is apostle, it's the same word that is used as of Apostle Paul. But in this sense, I think it's used more in the general sense that he's the sent one. He's not an apostle that received the uh, revelation from, from the Lord, but he's an apostle because Paul sent him to, to, uh, to testify, to, to help, to serve in the ways that others couldn't. He was the sent one. He was the apostle. He was the one that ministered to those, to the Philippian church, and he even was un, close unto death. And we know that he brought the gift that the Philippian church prepared. He brought it to Paul, and Paul, that was a great encouragement to Paul. And also we see that he was also, 
one who ministered to my needs. So it was not beneath this man, Epaphroditus, to serve, even in the small things uh, like maybe doing the dirty work, maybe preparing some kind of food, maybe doing, running some kind of errand, doing something that maybe does not seem very important, but in the service of the Lord, everything we do is important as long as our heart is right, because we can do the, the smallest things, and if our heart is right, God will reward us for that. But if we do like very high calling things that are very important, but if we do it with the wrong motives, the, the Lord will not take that as a sacrifice. So we see that he was a man that was dedicated to the Lord, and he was doing, willing to do minister, just like Paul says, that I should minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel. And this man was also one willing to minister. And the last question I would like to ask before we close is, what kind of brother was Epaphroditus to Paul? What can we learn from this man that we can apply in our lives? Because we know this, these men lived thousands of years ago. What is it to us today? But in, even in this man's character, we see things that we can learn. So first of all, we see that uh, he was a man of love and concern for his brethren, the Philippian church. He cared truly. Verses 25 uh, 26 says, Since he was longing for you all and distressed because you have heard that he was sick, he loved the church so much that he was more worried, not about him being sick, but about the Philippian church being worried that he was sick. That, that brought him more distress because he, he did not want everybody to know about his sickness. So he was, he was caring. He cared truly for the church. He was also a man devoted to the work of the Lord, work of Christ. In verse 30, we see, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. He was willing to even die for him, for the Lord. That's how much he loved these people. And we should be willing to devote our whole life towards Christ. And sometimes it will mean we have to give up even our life. And we live in such a country where we don't think about that we might actually have to give up our lives for Christ. But if we truly begin to live the way Christ wants us to live, then there will always be persecution. So we should be willing to to give everything we have towards the Lord, to the service of the Lord. And lastly, we see that he was a man who was not, he didn't mind being called just a messenger. He was somebody who did the small work, but he ministered. He ministered, he did what the, what the Lord called him to do. And if we, if we look at chapter 4, 18, it talks about him again. Indeed, I have all... Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to, to, to God. So we see that this man was also devoted. He, what kind of characteristics can we take away from his life that we can apply to our, our, ourselves is the willingness to serve others sacrificially. So we saw, we saw these two, two young men, or we, we don't know the age of Epaphroditus, but two men that served Christ. They both served them sacrificially. And Apostle Paul started by saying that we should have the mind of Christ. And we see that these two men had the mind of Christ or the, the attitudes of Christ, that thinking about others higher than ourselves. And, you know, in the very end, that the part, the, the verse that we read, it says to hold these kind of men in high esteem. So why does it say to hold them in high esteem? Because they served. I think that if we serve the Lord uh, faithfully, then the same verse could be applied to each one of us. Maybe when we get old and die, people will hold us in esteem because we serve the Lord. And that's what people remember. Not People will not remember what kind of house we had or what kind of money or what kind of car we drove, what kind of income we left to our children. Nothing will matter, only what we did for the Lord. And as here, Apostle Paul says, I will do everything in the Lord. He says, if the Lord wills, 
I will do this and that. I trust in the Lord. So we may not become as prominent as Paul was, even as Timothy, or even uh, as Peter was, but we could all uh, learn from these two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, who did the work. They were sincere, sincerely concerned about the condition of others. They were seeking first the things of Christ, their willingness to serve others, and the willingness to sacrifice themselves, even the point unto death. And we know that Apostle, says, Apostle Paul also says that we have the mind of Christ. Who has known the mind of the Lord, but we have the mind of Christ. And let us think about these words today, that if we have the mind of Christ, if we focus on the things of Jesus, the things of heavenly things, uh, things above, we will be able to live the way that God wants us to live. Amen.